Aloha Aina. Aloha Aina. All right. How old you hoi hoi I'm excited to to get we, we had a great two panels, first two panels. I'm excited for our next panel. But before we get started, I want to mahalo all of our volunteers. Brother Oren over there doing the sound. Brother Uncle Doug over here getting the live stream. For all of our friends who aren't able to be here at Thomas Square, uh, we are Cool Cool Consulting. We're happy to help um, in this discussion tent again this year. And we really appreciate um, this next panel because our friends, Brother Andre Perez and Tita Camille Kalama have helped um, to organize this discussion tent for almost four or five years. And when I first got involved, um, it was this discussion tent about four years ago that really helped open up uh, the light bulb for me. So on our next panel, we've got the title is called Demystifying Activism, Nonviolent Direct Action, led by Brother Andre. So, mahalo, you guys. Let's give a round of applause, Brother Andre. Hey, aloha. <clears throat> aloha, Kako. Aloha. Mahalo. Thank you. Um, and I just want to clarify when this first dis uh, discussion tent was first became a part of Lahoi, it was through an organization called MANA, Movement for Aloha no Kaina, that we were involved in and um, kind of really driven by our friend Ilima Long. And, for a few years, we were always trying to bring uh, more critical discussion to um, Lahoi, and um, it's continued. And now, um, Brother Josh is taking over the the um, the organizing of the the panel discussions. Um, but for today, um, our talk we're going to keep it short. But we wanted to really have a discussion and kuka kuka, kind of off the cuff talk around. Activism, nonviolent direct action, and so we we chose the, the title demystifying a activism and nonviolent direct action. What it is, what it isn't, um, what strategy and tactics are, and what they're not, and um, the difference between organizing and mobilizing, or uh, protest and nonviolent direct action. So uh, we're gonna keep it short, but I think to kind of really dig into um, some of the content, the, the critical um, part, or the rather the misconceptions around activism is that it's just limited to protest. And I've heard people define it as screaming and shouting and we don't want to do that. And I've, I've always felt that there's really been a concerted effort to marginalize and to frame activism as, and reduce it really as screaming and shouting and protest. And when people, my response to that is if people think that activism and nonviolent direct action is just screaming and shouting, then you don't know what it is. Um, because activism um, really is, at the core, it's concerted effort and organizing and utilizing many approaches and tactics to, to generate, to cause social change and to address injustice. And one of the ways, uh, one of the fundamental approaches to address injustice is to find out the truth. Truth is the foundation of, of justice. And so um, I'd say uh, maybe about four or five years ago, we really started to um, dig into activism and we started traveling to the states, to places like Colorado, um, with the Indigenous Peoples Power Project, which I work closely with now, um, to Oakland with the uh, Oakland School of Unity and Liberation and the Ruckus Society. Um, I really wanna give a lot of a shout out to these organizations for really helping us um, learn the science of activism and nonviolent direct action. And um, I've been fortunate to also work closely with uh, Greenpeace and attend their action camps and become a trainer for them in the blockades uh, track. And so I, I've started to realize um, that a lot of things that we've done here in Hawaii were kind of organic without training. Um, and there was a time when we were, in particular, we had an action on Kauai at Naui, uh, was a burial issue where 
this um, rich foreigner from from America was wanting to build a house on this burial site. They had over 40 traditional burials there. And so we organized direct action and we uh, went in and shut down construction for a day and we locked down, locked ourselves down on site. And it was kind of, I always laugh about this, but it was in that action that I thought that we had developed a format. We had came up with these different positions like who's the action, who's the, the action coordinator or the police liaison or the, um, we had, um, we had foot, uh, video document, people doing video documentation, both inside our group, internally, when we would have our discussion, and, and then outside, you know, filming the police. And I, I kind of laugh about it now, because after that was done, I was like, hey, we should use this as a format. It, it was a really good action. We had really good organization and leadership and decision making was very smooth. And I thought that we had created this format. And then I went and trained with Greenpeace and Ruckus Society. And I was like, this is old stuff already. This is their, their, really, their, um, their MO. And so um, activism really, um, if you're trained in it and you understand um, some of the techniques and methods, it's very organized. And there's analysis on your opposition. There's a lot of strategy that goes on. There's a lot of tactics that are utilized um, towards your, your goals and objectives. Um, and nonviolent direct action really is an intervention, right? And there's analysis around how to intervene. They talk about intervening. You, you, you have analysis on where the, the flow of power is and how to disrupt that. So they call it points of intervention. And in points of intervention, there's points of production where they, where they manufacture things. And how do you disrupt that? Points of consumption where people like us, we, we consume, we buy the product. How can we disrupt points of consumption? Um, and there's other, uh, many other points of intervention that I won't go into too much detail, but I just want to um, also mention that some of the best analysis that I learned uh, around Nonviolent direct action was really from the Serbians in the Otpor movement, and we were fortunate to train with Canvas um, out of Serbia, the Center for Applied Nonviolent Action Strategies. And these really are today they're the the students who what was it, 15, 18 years ago were struggling against the brutal dictatorship of Slobodan Milosevic, and they were very creative in their tactics and they had a lot of analysis around where the power is and how to disrupt that power, how to dismantle that power, and um, how to really bring people together to build critical mass. And I believe, in my opinion, I've been through a lot of training, they have some of the best analytics around activism. Because in a brutal dictatorship, you don't want to get arrested, you can't get arrested. You get arrested and you might never be seen again in places like Serbia. So they had to be very careful with their strategy and tactics. And we learned a lot, but the key thing for them was it starts with a vision for tomorrow. What's the long-term vision? So if not, you're just putting out small fires constantly, right? We, the, the idea is to have um, a long-term goal of, of, of really creating power and really dismantling the oppressive power and so that you come into your own and you, you know, really bring people together for long-term protracted struggle. Um, and so that's, I think that's what we need to be thinking about. One of the first things early on in the Mauna Kea struggle, we were, we were all there to stop the TMT, the construction of the world's, at that time, largest telescope. And so we had one of the most critical um, congregations, a uh, critical mass of Hawaiians and supporters on Mauna Kea, probably one of the biggest sort of um, movements in modern times in, in the past 30 years since Kaho Olave probably. Um, but we only, for Hawaii, but we only were focused on stopping the TMT. We weren't talking about the vision for tomorrow for Mauna Kea. Who's going to control Mauna Kea? Who's going to ensure that, where's the power gonna lie? 
So if we only stop the telescope and we don't think about control of the mountain, the land, you know, the processes, then we're just putting on a fire and we're waiting for the next one to start, yeah? Um, but I want to pass it off to Camille and, and talk a little bit about how activism intersects maybe with legal strategies and how they complement each other. And we can't, there was a time where I was not really interested in the legal strategies. Um, but I realize now that we really kind of have to work side by side. And because the politicizing of the issue through activism can affect the legal outcomes. And the legal outcomes, and I know this because um, the legal outcomes can affect also the activism. And in particular, when a bunch of us got arrested on Mauna Kea, um, the political activism affected how the case, how the lawsuit turned out. And she'll tell you more about it in terms of the Supreme Court ruling. And then that came back around full circle and affected how our arrests and our charges and how our cases were dealt with. But Camille, you wanna talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Sure, aloha. Um, I'm Camille Kalama. I've been um, an attorney with the Native Hawaiian Legal Corporation for the last 13 years, just about. So um, many of the struggles, mahalo. <laughs> um, you know, our, our nonprofit law firm is really exists to fight for our Native Hawaiian rights um, and land issues, water issues, things that really relate to um, caring for this place that we all want to call home. And so many of the struggles that have happened over the years have involved legal battles but have also involved activism. And so as an attorney, I talk to other attorneys who want to prioritize the legal battles, you know, and sometimes even tell other people or tell the community, like, hang on, we got this, you know, we got the court case, don't mess it up. And the opposite too, you know, sometimes people feel and it's justified that we're always losing in court, you know, so why try? But when you have, you know, when you're on the side without as much physical power, you got to use the tools that you have. And everybody has talents and everybody has roles to play. And that's, I think, one of the biggest messages that, that we try to put out there is that you might think, you know, well, I'm not in a position to do much. But up on the Mauna, there are people cooking. There are people, you know, holding sign. There was also the legal battle making its way through the courts. And so wherever you are, there is, you just gotta find where your kuleana is, you know, and where you fit into whatever struggle it is that you are, you know, feel passionately about and wanna support. Um, there's a place for you, and sometimes you gotta be patient and wait to find it. Um, Cause if you're going in there blazing and being like, okay, I know what to do. <laughs> um, sometimes that's, that's not the most helpful either. So it's really, um, knowing that and knowing where your contribution is going to be and sometimes figuring out as you go along. But in terms of Hawaii's history, you know, we've had um, many of the significant successes have come through struggles all over, you know, with Kaho'olawe, um, having the island, at least the, the bombing stopped by the military making space for Kanaka and, and others to come and see what it is to, to rebuild a place that's been damaged for so long, you know, and so badly with so many bombs that are still there in the Aina. But it has become such a learning place, you know, such a place of hope for people who can see that now. But that battle came through people like, you know, Uncle, Uncle Walter, who's here today, and others who said, don't tell me what to do. I'm going to go there. It's, the only thing I have left is my body to put in between them and the island. And that's the best that I can do. And the only thing I, I feel like I have left. Um, there was also a lawsuit that was filed that went on. And that was one of the early struggles that really wasn't only what they did for Kaho'olawe, but it's what Kaho'olawe is still doing. And that struggle still does for all of us to inspire us to tell us that, hey, even when the biggest military power in the world wants your island and wants to bomb it and wants to use it for practice, coming together, we can show them that we have power too. And the power is in our aloha for this aina, you know? 
And when we're really, when we don't have the physical power, what do we do? We have ways to message to the rest of the world that this is shameful, you know, that there are actions that are being done that are just really shameful and shouldn't happen. And that's our power, right? Public opinion. So we look at um, Honokohua, that was in the early 90s, the struggle to protect our Ivi Kupuna, our um, burials, where the Ritz Carlton excavated some 400, 1400? Yeah. To make way for a hotel. And it took guys like Uncle Skippy, Iwane, and others jumping the fence, literally, to get in front of the bulldozers and say, Aole, that's enough. And that struggle led to the creation of our burial laws today, Hawaii Revised Statutes Chapter 6E. And those are laws that we continue to rely on to protect um, our EV t now and from other projects from happening. And it's not like it's over. It's not like all our EV are protected and everything's good. You know, it's a constant struggle. It's a constant battle to enforce, to remind, and to remember. What else happened after? After, yep, there was uh, Waukele Opuna that happened at least 20 years ago. Yeah. yeah. But that was a struggle to protect um, the pristine forest, native forest on Hawaii Island from geothermal development. Same thing, that involved many court cases, um, some successful, some not, but it also involved activism by the community. And at one point, there were so many people arrested at once that they really couldn't process them, 140 at a time. Um, so those are the kinds of things that are happening. And, and I guess for me, as an attorney working on these cases, that's what I always want to remind everyone else, is that you're the most important. And the ones that are continuing on to fight for these things, to malama, to practice, engage in practice, that's the most important thing. We're just there to try to make sure you can do that, you know? But if we don't have people going there, if we don't have people valuing these places and these practices, then why would anyone um, protect them, you know? It's up to us. We gotta value them and we gotta work to protect them. Um, so just to finish off with Mauna Kea, we had... Right, right. So, we had been fighting a case um, against the solar telescope on Haleakala. One thing to, not everyone might know is that these telescopes would be the largest structures on the respective islands. So for Maui, the solar telescope would be eight stories tall. That was taller than the highest building. For Mauna Kea, it was gonna be 18 stories from the very bottom to the top. That's taller than any hotel, any office building on the whole island. And this was supposed to happen in a conservation zone. So it's supposed to be the most protected place, and yet they're allowing it to have um, practically an industrial facility. And so for the solar telescope, we fought on the same laws, on the same basis, that you can't do this in a, in a conservation zone. These buildings are not something that are gonna benefit this place, make it better. Um, and we, we didn't succeed. The solar telescope was in progress. For Mauna Kea, when the action started and the activism started, the telescope had not started yet. The construction hadn't started, just the grading had, had just begun, barely begun. When folks came up onto the Mauna to physically put their bodies in front, because in that case too, the court case was proceeding. It was in front of the Supreme Court at that point, and the court hadn't even ruled yet. And so you had hundreds of people up there saying, wait a second, you know, one, this is wrong. Two, you're not even waiting for the Supreme Court to say what they think about this. And it turns out the court said the process was wrong. Basically, the, the permits were granted without any, um, before the hearing even started. So that means the decision makers are making their decision and then saying, okay, now we'll hear from you. And that's just not in any way, shape or form a fair hearing. Um, besides all the legal issues. So that court ruling came after some of the biggest protests on the Mauna. But right before the ruling, the court also granted an emergency injunction 
That for our Haleakala case, we filed at least four different times to stop the construction until the court was able to rule on the case, and we lost every single one. So by the time the Supreme Court ruled on the solar telescope, the telescope was halfway built. Once you get to that point, you're pretty much done, you know? So the protests on Mauna Kea were saying, hey, you can't do this, you know, because then you've already let it happen. But the chances of them reversing it and the real, the possibility of protecting the place from desecration is done, you know? If you let them get halfway, you've already done so much of the damage that we're trying to stop. Um, so the court in that case, they heard an emergency ruling because everyone was gearing up to go on the Mauna. The, gover the governor, the, the government was talking about bringing in National Guard and it was gearing up to be a big showdown and the Supreme Court intervened and, and put an injunction in place. We were on the plane on the way there when we heard about it. So we went anyway just to celebrate. But um, when the court finally did rule, what happened in, in the court, the criminal cases for trespassing um, was that the court actually let, let people um, bring, right, bring up their own defense and say, hey, I was there out of necessity. I had no choice because, you know, they weren't listening to the court. It wasn't even done. Everything, and that's the importance. We did everything we could to try to go through the process. And the process is wrong. And so now all we're left with is our, our bodies to go up there. And the court in that case found them not guilty and let them go. Can you talk about how the Supreme Court ruled that you had religious rights without traditional customary practice? Yeah, so in November when the court actually made its ruling, they said it was contested whether there's actually religious practices on Mauna Kea because there was a study that said, well, this little spot, it's nine acres, where the telescope was going to go, we can't see any evidence of religious practice in that spot on the Mauna. We can't, um, there's no artifacts, there's no archaeological sites, and therefore this nine acres that we have, um, Native Hawaiian traditional customary practices don't exist. And the court said, I don't think so. <laughs> if you look at the testimony, you look at um, you know, how important Mauna Kea is to our people, they accepted it. They said it's undeniable, you know, you have it's clear that there is religious practice connected with Mauna Kea. And we're not going to just circle this little area and say it doesn't occur there. So you, you have no religious rights up there. And that was really key for the court dealing with all of the trespassing issues. Yeah. So when that played out, in particular with uh, my arrest on Mauna Kea, it was interesting because I was representing myself and of course with guidance from her but I was I had no uh, attorney assigned to me I was pro se so I had to be really organized and I had to understand the criteria uh, the, the criteria the criteria to that for the argument that I was using which is choice of evils and m one of my concerns was religious I was trying to establish that I had ancestral connection my mother was born in the same district as Mauna Kea that I had a foundation of traditional uh, religious practice and that I had teachers. And then the judge kind of cut me off and said, Andre, you don't need to establish that. The court already recognizes that you have religious rights on Mauna Kea. And that was because of the, the lawsuit. So how it came back, so that made it a little easier, the lawsuit, which I wasn't part of, but it, in my defense, I didn't have to establish that I had religious, religious rights or practices. But what I had to establish was that I, that I did um, meet the three criteria for my argument, which was choice of evils. And those criteria, the criteria was one, that I had sincere, I had a sincere belief and that I was doing the right thing, that I was upholding the law, um, that I, you know, that I was sincere in what I was doing. The other thing was that I, uh, and also I sincerely believed that there was imminent harm. That's the key thing, imminent harm about to happen. The other one was that I had exhausted all remedy. And the third one was, what is it? Um, 
I had yeah, I had just no no other um, options really. So when I went into the you know I I went on the stand and argued my own defense. I told the judge um, that in terms of the, the sincerity argument that I sincerely believe that you don't have any authority over this mountain because of the, his the political history of the illegal overthrow, illegal annexation, and subsequent, subsequent illegal statehood act. And I don't believe you have authority over me as a, as a Hawaiian, and I don't believe that the, the state has authority over this land. But I told her, I sincerely believe that. I don't expect you to believe that, but I want you to believe that I sincerely believe that. And she kind of was like, it's the first one, because usually people want the judge to agree that they don't have jurisdiction, and that's a dead end road. They're never going to agree to that. So I told her, you don't have to agree with that, but you have to know that I sincerely believe that after 20 years of studying my political history, this is my conclusion. Illegal overthrow, illegal annexation, illegal statehood, illegal occupation. You don't have authority over me. I sincerely believe that. And she said, okay. And then I said um, that I believe imminent harm was about to happen because for two primary reasons. One, I went up to the mountain and I saw heavy equipment staged on site. And I took photos of it. And the judge actually said, you're the first one to say that. And I said, I also know that in construction, the trend today is to have cultural monitors. When they do excavation, sometimes they'll have cultural monitors, people with cultural knowledge, to monitor the excavation in case they come across burials, cultural material, etc. And the cultural monitors are there to ensure compliance with the law. And I said, I seen a cultural monitor on that mountain the day that I got arrested. And the only reason there would be a cultural monitor is because they were about to excavate. And how do I know that? Because I used to be a cultural monitor. I was a cultural monitor on Kaho Olave, and I've done cultural monitor work here on Oahu. And I knew the guy that was on the mountain, and I knew what he was there for. And so that really was the basis for my, my argument for imminent um, concern for imminent desecration. The threat was about to happen. And anyways, long story short, by the time I was done with my testimony, um, the judge asked the prosecutor if she wanted to cross-examine me. And the cross I, I mean, this was, I, I've never heard of this. The prosecutor said no. And then the judge said, at the end, does the prosecutor have any final arguments? And the prosecutor said no. And when I came off the stand and I sat back down on, at the, whatever, the table, in front of the judge, the prosecutor leaned over to me and said, you did a good job. Um, so how we learn the law part, the legal strategies combined with the activism together, um, I think is very important. Um, and so with that said, you know, I want to reiterate activism, when we really understand there's a science to it, there's knowledge and um, analysis around strategy and tactics. It's not just screaming and yelling and shouting on a, on a street corner. Um, and again, I'll say this again, if that's what you think it is, you don't know what activism is. Um, I want to point out, um, in terms of strategy and tactics, it's important to know the difference because it gets confused a lot. So, um, I spent a month at Standing Rock as a nonviolent direct action trainer there in North Dakota. And one of the things that I learned from the Serbians was their, uh, their analysis around power is really really good so they talk about when there's a the, the, the they use the model of there's a dictator what upholds the power of the dictator well there's these pillars of power right and we all know what they are but we don't really think about it of course one of them is law enforcement one is military one might be the church or the clergy not always one is definitely the city government and so these different pillars of power um, they have really good analysis that if you push against the power, all you do is you cause it to compress and galvanize itself. If you push hard, right? If you push against the cops, if you come in yelling and screaming and shouting and aggressive, what's the cops going to do? They're going to band together and they're going to become aggressive. Well, that what I learned from the Atpour movement was they had an analysis of pulling the power. 
So if you think of these pillars as upholding the power, you begin to pull it and dismantle it. So they were talking about how when, when they were in the dead of winter in Serbia, occupying the streets by the thousands, and the police are out there in the snow freezing ass with everybody else, right, where everyone's cold, the student activists would, would bring bowls of soup to the police or cups of tea or, you know, give them flowers and really engage. And somebody who doesn't understand strategy and tactics would see that as, oh, you're kissing their ass or, oh, you're, you know, you're being nice to the cops, not realizing that it's all tactics. Because what happened in their case was when the government bought in the military, which was coming in with armed with live rounds, it was the police after a lot of pulling and developing a rapport and relationships. It was the police that warned them, the military's coming in tomorrow, you guys better be careful. And so even in our case, we have a unique situation here in Hawaii, you know, and it's, it, it, it's a tough one. I, I've talked about it with many people on the continent from our Native American brothers and sisters to our Black Lives Matters um, movement friends there to the Latino movement. And over there, it's different. The cops are brutally abusive. And there's really, really, usually when they call the cops in, you don't really know the cops, right? It's, it's a big place. But here in Hawaii, it's a little bit different. When the cops come in, we have relatives, cousins, aunties, uncles, guys you went to high school with. We know half the cops are Hawaiians oftentimes. So it's even more um, conducive, I would say, for us to understand the tactic of pulling the cops and not pushing and forcing them to galvanize. And I've been, uh, I've been in situations where we were occupying Iolani Palace. We, were in, we got into the, the palace, we were up on the second floor, we had dropped our banners and flags, we were giving speeches, and the head law enforcement officer came in and we, he, he worked with us, you know, he was cordial, so we were cordial. Um, he was flexible, so we tried to be a little flexible without compromising our principles. And at the end of the day, he gave us everything we wanted. And the, the most important thing was they, they didn't want to arrest us and we were fully prepared to get arrested, but they weren't going to do it. So then we were, you know, we always got to have an exit strategy. So our plan was we were going to stay there for five hours, give speeches, make our presence known in the U.S. Congress in D.C. while they were debating um, an issue. And that happened. So we had accomplished our goal. And at the end of the day, we had all the media outside. They wanted us to, they were going to escort us out of the, the palace, out the back door. And I said, no, we can never go out the back door as Hawaiians. And I told the head officer who was a Hawaiian, how do you think that makes us feel that we're going to exit the back door of the palace? We're going to, and they never use the front door. If you've been to Iolani Palace, it's roped off. There's a, they literally have pressure sensitive alarms. And uh, we demanded that we go out the front door and we exited out the front door. Media was there and we had a great media opportunity that came out of that. Um, so we were able to pull that law enforcement officer to be kind of flexible with us. At Standing Rock, it was very brutal. A, a lot of the police were from interstate, other states, so they were shooting people in the face with rubber bullets. We all know the story. Hosing them down and wetting with fire hoses in the dead of winter. Um, you know, throwing concussion grenades. And then there was this opportunity that some people felt was controversial, but I didn't. I saw it as a, as a clear tactic. And what happened was the police were running out of money. So part of Standing Rock the occupation was successful in that it was draining the budgets for the police overtime, you know. And I mean, they, I think they went a million dollars in the hole with all the law enforcement there. So then they put a public call out to the, the local community there in um, Bismarck, North Dakota, and they were asking for donations for the police officers who were on site at Standing Rock. And they asked for Red Bull, they asked for granola bars, for paper cups and paper plates, um, for, for um, snacks. So we seized the opportunity working with uh, the youth council, the um, International Indigenous, Indigenous Youth Council that really started the Standing Rock movement. And we had a meeting and we said, hey, they're asking for donations. Why don't we give them donations? And we're gonna show them what it means 
Our message is we're going to teach you what it means to be humane, to have a sense of humanity. And we're going to show them that Standing Rock, this, this camp of eight to 10,000 people is self-sufficient and we have enough to share. And we're going to teach them compassion. So we put a, together these boxes of granola, everything that they wanted. Granola bars, snacks, um, but they wanted Red Bull and energy drinks. And the, the youth decided we're not going to give them um, energy drinks because that's not healthy. We're going to buy them cases of water and we're going to tell them water is life. So we delivered all this stuff to the police department. And we had a huge media opportunity. And we, had the, we knocked on the door and the cops were looking all you know, uncomfortable in their SWAT team gear. And you know, they came outside and said, hey, we saw your ad in the newspaper. You guys are looking for donations. We're from Standing Rock. We want to share some things with you. Here's the granola bars. Here's the paper cups and plates. We didn't get you, and one of the youth said, we didn't get you the energy drinks because those aren't healthy for you. But here's a couple of cases of water. And on the case, it was written, water is life. Some people saw that as we were kissing the cop's ass. It was a tactic. We understood what they were doing to us there, but it was a tactic to undermine, to undermine and to highlight, you know, their brutality with our humanity. You see that? So we got to be careful in, in thinking about how we think about stra strat the strategy really was to stop the pipeline. But the, the way to do that is you need critical mass. You need public opinion. And so when they're um, shooting people with bean bags and rubber bullets in the face, and we're coming back and we're showing them compassion and humanity. It's really the essence of, in, 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 of Gandhian philosophy, Satyagraha. Yeah, it's about nonviolent direct action is always about sacrifice. It's always about putting your body on the line and sacrificing that. As Gandhi says, the weakest are really the strongest. The women, the elders, the children, when they become brutalized and abused, if that happens, heaven forbid, we don't want that to happen, but when it does happen, that's when public opinion is affected in the most powerful ways. That's when people get upset, people get angry. And so um, using that model just as, as an example of a tactic, it wasn't a strategy, it was a simple tactic to undermine the police and highlight the difference between them and us. Um, so we also talk um, about the importance of understanding mobilizing versus organizing. Sometimes we get a little confused there. It's really easy. When we show up for what, you know, what is, is a protest, um, and sometimes it's necessary, uh, we'll go down to the state capitol or to the office of Hawaiian Affairs. We're mobilizing. It's a short-term thing. But to really affect the long-term change, we've got to be organizing and building power, raising consciousness, bringing in uh, new people. And I'll say the number one goal of an... I always say this, and I believe this. The number one goal of an organizer is to always develop new leadership. Constantly develop new leadership. Bringing people in. You're building the movement. Um, and so, you know, uh, so the, the title of this talk is sort of this demystifying activism and nonviolent direct action. What it is, what it isn't. Um, you know, we, we just kind of wanted to briefly touch on that. So we, after um, a few years of going up and training with Greenpeace, with the Ruckus Society, Indigenous People's Power Project, Iraq Vets Against the War, one of the most principled, um, um, they're, they're now called About Face, but just a great bunch of people, one of the best groups I've ever worked with. Um, you know, we start to realize that we can't be flying out. If we're thinking about long-term organizing and attending these trainings in Iowa or in Oakland or in DC, we gotta develop our own capacity to have nonviolent direct action training here in Hawaii. So we created the Hawaii Unity and Liberation Institute, and it was really driven by the old slogan from one of our first modern <coughs> activist movements in the early 70s, Kokua Hawaii, and their slogan at the time was Huli. And so, as it was told to me by one of my mentors, Soli Nihil, Huli was really the, the closest term for revolution. Of course, early 70s, coming out of the 60s, Black Panthers, Chicano Revolutionary Party, you know, the, the whole consciousness around revolution was big. So Huli was the term to overturn, to cause change. Revolution, and of course, um, some of the Kokua Hawaii members had gone to a Black Panther convention in 1971, I think, and they came back politicized and militant with the Black Berets. 
and they, they, the power of the people fist, but they put a poi pounder in it for the cultural context of Hawaiians, Hawaiian power to the people. And, um, and so, in, so the, the, the slogan was Huli, the logo was the fist with the poi pounder. And my, our, our mentor, many of us, Soli Nihil, always wanted us to keep that memory, that slogan, that logo alive. And he told me, use it, Andre, keep it going. And so when we thought about me and Camille, I remember we were sitting on the couch and I said, hey, what can we make, um, how can we turn Huli into an acronym for our, for our nonviolent direct action training organization? And I, I said, how's about um, Hawaii Unity and Liberation Initiative? And Camille told me, uh, initiative's kind of a temporary thing, short-term thing. What about institute? Because we'll do training, education, and also research. And we were, you know, at the time, I'm a student. Our good friend Ilima um, Kalekoa um, is a professor. So we do do research, and we do do teach. We're all mostly educators. So we formed the uh, Hawaii Unity and Liberation Institute in memory and in honor of the movement, the roots of the movement, the Koku Hawaii slogan, Huli, and the power to the people. And so our, our goal, and we're still... We're still uh, developing a curriculum, but our goal is to um, provide nonviolent direct action training opportunities here in Hawaii. And so far, we've had a, a nonviolent direct action training in Kona. We've had an action art camp at our farm this past summer at Hana Kehau. And we got a grant we really want to mention and mahalo and honor the Hawaii People's Fund, which is a critical part of organizing this event. But the Hawaii People's Fund has always been there to support the Hawaiian sovereignty movement, and they've given us a grant to host three nonviolent direct action trainings in Hawaii this coming year. So keep an eye out. Um, I want to talk a, talk a little bit about the importance of art. We don't ever really think about art. Art and activism go hand in hand. Art really is the power. But can I hand it off to you to talk about art and how it should come up front and why it's important? Visual, yeah. I'm gonna let Camille talk about it so I don't hog the mic. <laughs> sure. Um, you know, a lot of times it's hard for people to find their place and get involved because it's, it can be scary, you know, to get on the front lines at a place like Standing Rock where you might get hit in the face with rubber bullets or um, tased or who knows what. But one way to get involved uh, in action and activism is through art through creating art and creating messaging because that's what really is up front if you think about it, you know? The folks getting arrested, sure, um, that says a lot, but if nobody else in the world knows why they're getting arrested when they see it on TV, how effective is that, right? So everyone has probably heard the slogan from Standing Rock, which Andre already said, but um, you know, water is life. We know that way out here in Hawaii. Why? Because they put so much into three words, right? It really tells a story of what the struggle is up there. That they're trying to protect their water because that pipeline could basically destroy their way of life over there. If it leaks, when it leaks. Um, and so th that message is critical. And the imagery that comes with the protest is so important. If you just see a bunch of people and police on the other side, you don't understand what the movement is really about, right? You just see it, you see a bunch of people gathered and it could take a lot of time to explain um, to the outside world what's happening in your community. But we over here, we're seeing pictures, we were seeing pictures of dogs attacking women and children, you know, at, at the pipeline. And our own kids were like, you gotta go help, mom, you know? You're seeing, the police brutality, but you're also hearing what, what they're for. You know, we're here trying to protect our land. We're trying to protect our people and everyone that's downstream. So for Mauna Kea, we, we saw kind of messages on both sides, right? We had the Aole TMT, so no telescope, but we also had We Are Mauna Kea, you know, and protect Mauna Kea, those kinds of things. So those messages and the imagery that comes from those messages are critical because it's part of reclaiming our own stories. Because the media is going to tell the story. It's going to be a bunch of, you know, a bunch of activists, you know, out there protesting, screaming and shouting. Um, 
So our chant sometimes to tell our side of the story is like, you know, a sound bite. That might be all you have. Uh, so it's really critical to put time and effort and thought and strategy into your art, into your messaging. And sometimes people ask, like, well, why isn't it, why shouldn't we be violent? You know? And that's a really important thing to understand when we're fighting powers that are greater than us. Because one person's actions can affect everyone and the whole movement you're trying to, to um, what you're trying to protect. So if one person reacts, one person succumbs, I guess, to the antagonism, it can make it really risky and dangerous for everyone who's with you on that mauna that day or who's with you in that field that day because that gives justification for using power against the people who are there protesting. And so one, one critical thing I think that comes with art and messaging is the idea that one, you really gotta do your homework. You know, George, as George Helm said, do your homework. You need to know why you're there, what you're doing there. Why, why is it important and why should other people care? And how do you send a message out there and put an image out there that will bring them in? Like Andre said, you're trying to pull them in. Even the cops when they're standing across from you, you know, you're over there telling them, we're here to protect our water, we're here to protect our mauna. You know, you give them things that are inarguable. You know, what are you here for? You heard some cops saying, oh, we're, we're there to escort them up the mountain, you know, to build the building. But on their own shirts, it said that they're the State Department of Land and Natural Resources, you know, conservation enforcement. We're like, this is conservation, not what you're trying to do. So it's always, it's always knowing, um, knowing your audience, knowing your opposition, and knowing, I think most importantly, who you are and why you're there. Because you know? if you stay in line with our values, with, um, you know, with, the, with where you come from, you can't go wrong. But if you start to get into the little battles that they're constantly trying to start between our own people divide and conquer, make us fight each other. Um, that's how we get spread out. And when we're, no matter what it is we're fighting for, right now it, you know, it's the planet with climate change and, and all the powers that, are, that we're having to fight against as everyday people. Um, you only have so much energy, right? The only way we can do it is with literally everyone, right? We all our communities need each other. Everyone that's fighting for for um, you know the welfare of the world, really. We really gotta work together. And so if, if our energies are limited and we're fighting huge power, corporations, money, and military, we have to conserve ourselves and fight those battles together and not let them pull us into battles against each other. So I think when it comes to, like when we're talking about strategy and tactics that's part of the analysis is like where can we have an effect where can we make change and it's direct action there's a reason it's called nonviolent direct action it's not nonviolent indirect action right so if we go we all go over there and stand by the wall and hold a sign it doesn't cause any change it's not direct it's very indirect but when everyone was on that mauna that day it's directly in front of the bulldozers, really. So, and it also has to make sense. So there was a purpose for being there that day. And of course, there's others saying, well, you're not there every day. Well, of course not. There's not bulldozers waiting to come up and build a telescope every day. That doesn't mean that we're not sincere and we're not real. It's just that there is a point to what we're doing and a time and a place for what we do. So I think in terms of Strategy and tactics is always context dependent. Where you are, who you are, and where you come from. And it's not something that's a one size fit all, fits all for every issue, for every people. So part of it is understanding the basic philosophy and then applying it to where you are and when you are. Mahalo, Camille. And so what I saw, the power of visuals, probably the most powerful expression I saw was at Standing Rock where they had a tent that was about this size, maybe a little bigger, in the middle of a field, in the middle of the snow, and they were had all these artists, they were pumping out images, banners, silkscreen, 
um, hula hoops where they sold these wind socks around hula hoops on a stick and they were billowing in the wind saying water is life so the and what usually happens in activism is banners and imagery and symbolism is always an afterthought like hey we're going we're going to have an action tomorrow can you make a banner and what i've learned from our, our friends in um, indigenous people's power project and greenpeace is that the art should be at the front well thought out and well established as you're developing the action it's not an afterthought um, and your slogans is really powerful so when we were on Mauna Kea, um, or the Mauna Kea struggle, which many of us were involved in, they tried to frame us, right? If we, if we allow the media to control the narrative, they're going to tell us, they're going to frame us the way they want to. So they tried to call us protesters. And then the message from Mauna Kea was, we're not protesters, we are protectors, right? And so how we reclaim the narrative when we have our own narrative. And that really influenced um, Standing Rock. They, they told us that they got the protectors from Mauna Kea and they called themselves water protectors. How Two words, how powerful is that? Water protectors. And um, the symbolism really, I mean, it's about creativity, right? So I see, I see Uncle, Uncle Palani Sanansi sitting here on the side. Um, he, he made me think of something. Uncle Palani is really responsible for the revitalization of Halle building, traditional Halle building, yeah? And that, the Halle as a symbol is so important. In 1979, I believe, the Protect Kaho'olave Ohana built one of the first modern, you know, rebuilt, revitalized them, one of the first modern Halles on Kaho'olave, and I believe it was Keone Fairbanks and Skippy Iwana and a bunch of PKO folks. And that Halle was a symbol of, of what Lakea Tras would call the return of the Maka'i Nana, yeah? That we're back. You know, the people, a symbol of occupation, reoccupation of Kaho Olave. And that one Hale was so powerful and so inspirational. And now due to Uncle Palani, who helped rebuild the new Hale on Kaho Olave. And there's Hales on every island now. Really has a very powerful history and symbolism of Hawaiians that we are, we are back on our Aina and that we are, we're not a dead people. We're living, thriving, dynamic people, and we're asserting ourselves. And, and we're, we're akamai, we're intelligent, yeah? We're not slovenly or lazy or in a state of apathy. Um, so symbolism can have many forms, many shapes, and it's really important to the movement. The last thing I wanna talk about, two things, is one is action logic. And it's, that's one of the most critical things and action logic is defined as whatever your visuals are, your symbolism, your message, your signs, your banners, to the passerby, to somebody who only has 10 seconds to look at it, it makes sense to them. They understand what the issue is about, right? Action logic is, is, is that, that clear, concise messaging that immediately makes sense to, the, to anybody, the public viewing it. But action logic, um, another definition is that it, whatever your actions are, what you do in your direct action, in your activism, it has a logic to it too, right? So you're not doing things that are confusing to the movement or even to your own strategy. You gotta have action logic in your actions. You gotta have action logic in your messaging. It's gotta make sense. Um, or you're just sort of wasting energy and spinning your wheels. Um, I, I use this example. Um, one time, and I won't say any names, but this is a good example, and I'm only using it for the example. There's an issue of Queen's Hospital. Queen's Hospital was created during the Kingdom era for Hawaiians to have free health care. Um, and that, it, that hospital started off as a, a public trust um, for, because of the impact to Native Hawaiians with health issues and disease and stuff. Well, Queen's Hospital has been co-opted and privatized, basically. The will that created it, the trust that created it, has sort of been co-opted and just totally undermined. So there's been, throughout the years, there's been uh, Hawaiians in, in, within the past 20 years who have been trying to raise attention to Queen's Hospital co being co-opted and privatized and really not, it's not doing what it was intended to do. but. One time there was a, a little demonstration in front of Queen's Hospital by some Hawaiians. 
and they were holding a sign that said free health care for Hawaiians. Is there any action logic to that? It just sounds like Hawaiians want free health care. So when I saw the sign, I was kind of disappointed. Like, damn, that's not good messaging. What we should say, a, a good sign would have been Queen's Hospital co-opted or, you know, uh, public health care privatized or something, right? Tell the story. Tell the, tell the story of what happened. But when people driving by see a sign that says free health care for Hawaiians, it just sounds like Hawaiians want free health care. And there's no context to it. Um, so the idea in action logic is to ensure that it's understandable and that it's contextualized properly, yeah? Um, and so that, that, that's just an example. We're going to wrap up. I'll take questions in a minute, but we're going to wrap up. And the last thing I want to talk about is uh, security culture in activism. Because we're not really tight here. Our relations and interactions with the police are much different than we would see in, in, uh, in the states, um, in the continent. Um, so security culture really is, is activism that is, um, is a component of activism that is very conscious and aware of digital security, of operational security, how we, where we talk, where we have conversations. You could be walking in Walmart and having a conversation and somebody could overhear. It's a consciousness, really. Uh, I wanna talk about security culture because last year at La Ho'i Ho'i Ea, this event, last summer, last July, one of our good friends, one of our Huli founders, Kale Koa Ka'el, came from Maui. And he noticed that he, it, in his subcon, he wasn't really conscious of it until after the fact, but he remembered that there was these big bratas in Aloha shirts at the airport. He kept seeing them. They were at the airport, they were on the plane with him, and then they were at La Ho'i'ea, and then we had a panel just like this, under this tent, on this table, talking about activism, and those same big bratas in Aloha shirts were hanging out right on the outside of the tent, and then we were silk screening last year, and they were hanging out around my tent. And then shortly after that, after La Ho'i, uh, like a week later, they had the big action on Haleakala where they got arrested. And when they, when Kalekoa got arrested, they took him into the back room and then he saw those three guys in Aloha shirts. They were cops that were doing surveillance on him. And they followed him on the airplane from Maui to Oahu, from the airport to La Ho'i'ea, and they were mingling with us. They were in the crowd. So security culture is really important, right? And, and, you know, I try to co-opt, again, co-opt, not emulate military. I, I spent a little bit of time in the military, but we talk about comsec, communication security, opsec, operational security, how we conduct ourselves, how we behave in public, how we maintain the consciousness, how we're aware of unsecure forms of communication. And, if, I mean, it's important that we have the consciousness of security culture and the evidence is here because we were, we were under surveillance last year and we might very well be under surveillance right now. Um, so anyways, mahalo nui, any final thoughts? No? We're gonna wrap it up and move into questions, Q&A for about five minutes. Okay, mahalo. You know, I really appreciate all the words that both of you have said today. I think taking indirect action is very, very important. However, I want you to know something that's, that's still missing. I went to the Hawaii Bar Association to ask to hire an attorney who spoke Hawaiian because that is the way the Hawaiian people and those of us who were, have ancestors like I do under the kingdom can take back the land. Without the land, you cannot do anything. I know one woman, a descendant, direct descendant of King Kamehameha II who's working on that. But without the attorneys that speak Hawaiian, they cannot take control of the judges. That is absolutely essential. And I don't know if University of Hawaii's training any attorneys that speak Hawaiian. I don't know if you have reached out to attorneys who are of Hawaiian blood to see your, you speak Hawaiian. How come the Hawaii Bar Association told me none of the attorneys spoke Hawaiian? That's 
Excellent. Okay. No, I, I just wanted to make that comment because it's very, very important that we develop more attorneys that speak Hawaiian because that's the only way you're going to overpower the judges because they don't know the Maheli, they don't know the other items. I know about six attorneys that speak Hawaiian. Um, hey, who knows? Um, but while well, well we're here, and mahalo, Auntie, but nonviolent direct action, I definitely believe, is one, one way, one prong. Um, yes, Doug. Let me give yes, go ahead. You know, right now, this year, it's the year of Olala Hawaii, but um, Kalekoa Kaeo is one who has taken action to raise that issue in the courts that, you know, he was there trying to Olalo and the judge didn't recognize him as being present. This is a judge who had um, convicted him the year before for a separate issue for a protest. Um, he had he heard for a direct action <laughs> to stop further construction for the solar telescope on Maui. Um, he had been to several hearings and had been speaking only Olalo in court for himself, representing himself. And at that particular time, the prosecutors on Maui had um, filed a motion to say, we want to have trial in English because it's easier. We don't have to fly in translators from another island because Hawaii Island's the only one with a certified translator. Um, so we want, to, we want you, judge, to have this trial in English because Kalekoa speaks English too. Um, and Kalekoa showed up, kept um, speaking in Olalo, and the judge called his name three times, went out in the hall, and issued a summons for his arrest. So um, form, I would not recognize you being present, right? Yeah. Right, he didn't recognize him as being present and issued a summons for his arrest. Yeah. It was eventually um, withdrawn, but he's someone who's raising that issue. There is a lot, a long ways to go, um, to get to where we need to be in the court system, it involves the language. You know, we're looking at, there is a project right now to develop the legal language um, in Olala Hawaii. And the way that they're going about it is looking back to all of the court cases, the laws um, that we already have in place. So not just coming up with new words out of the air, but bringing back, you know, there were session laws that were they were first enacted in Hawaiian, then translated to English. So you can see how they translated it back then. And so it's developing um, that body of language to be able to be effective in the courts. But when it comes to educating the courts about the mahele, about land title in Hawaii, um, that's something that is ongoing, you know, and understanding that our system in Hawaii is different, you know. Even though the United States is has the court system here, it's falling under that court system, even those courts recognize that our land tenure system is not the same. That when Kawikiauli set up the system here with the Mahele, whether you like what he did or didn't like what he did, it was incredible what he left as a legacy for our people by reserving the rights of native tenants in the Konohiki lands. Those, that is language that we still rely on from those documents back in the 1850s, 1840s, 1850s. But it still takes education, you know? And it's a constant process because not everyone, not everyone learns the political history, the, even just the legal history of Hawaii to understand where we are today because you can't, you can't understand land title today without doing that. Um, but yeah, there's a long way to go. <laughs> Hi, um, mahalo for, for doing this. Really uh, grateful for your um, time and effort here. I want to ask you a question. The theme is a nonviolent uh, direct action, but I've never been to any demonstration or anything where the demonstrators show up with you know helmets and weapons and tasers. It's always the other guys that have the implements of, of violence. And uh, I, I know how to keep them from not becoming violent, and that's just to obey them and go away and that kind of stuff. So is there any um, dynamic principle that during a demonstration you can limit 
their, you know, you don't want to go away. You want to be there, but you don't want them to bust out their stuff. Is there some principle of action where you can get the most demonstration without the violence? So on the continent, sometimes the laws are different. In Hawaii, um, resisting arrest is not, uh, passive resistance is not considered resisting arrest. So one of the ways that, um, you know, folks have already done this, as you've seen in Mauna Kea and other struggles, is to simply sit down, to stand, to stay there. As long as you're not actively resisting the cops, you're not resisting arrest. And that works if you're willing to get arrested, right? There's some folks that can't take the risk. So part of your activism is figuring out who's vulnerable and who's not. You know, who can, who can do that? Who can say, you know, if I do get arrested, so be it. There's some people that can't do that for many reasons. Um, but knowing, knowing that up front, because if you don't have enough people who are able to do that, sometimes you just can't make that stand, you know? And so Maui, that happened. Mauna Kea, there were seven, some 700 people on the mountain um, and they started to lay down. And it was really difficult for the cops at that point to, to remove them, right? But it's all situation dependent. On Maui, um, the cops literally pushed people out of the way the second time. The first time, they kind of waited it out. But the second time, they actively pushed people. And so some folks laid down, but the cops came and picked them up and moved them, you know? So if you don't have a critical mass, sometimes, um, you know, even the most you can do laying down there, it doesn't eventually, uh, you know, mean success. So part of it, like Andre said, is, is really building the movement so that by the time it gets to that point, you have enough people who understand the struggle, understand why it's important, and want to be there with you. If you're there five people by yourself, you can be in a pretty dangerous situation sometimes, right? <laughs> So all of that happens before, and it's all important to do things like this, to be here, um, to grow together, you know? So when the call comes, you have relationships with people, you know, we know each other. You have a community that you're fighting for, and it's also important to do all the things that, you know, so many folks here do. The Lomi folks, the, the Aina folks, the ones growing Kalo, that's all super critical. If we don't do that, then by the time it comes to, to figure out what are we fighting for, what are we trying to protect, you know, you're not going to have anyone behind you or next to you. So all of that, really, these struggles started way back, you know, with all of the things that we're really fighting for. Yeah, and let's just we'll touch on that real quick. And not other ways are, deep, again, it's situational and context. But non-cooperation can mean sitting down and locking arms. Um, uh, it can mean locking down with a, a PVC pipe cuff to a bulldozer. And really, at the end of the day, what these all boil down to are delay tactics, right? We want to delay. We want to cause um, in impact the cost, right? So in Mauna Kea, when we were up there, we, we decided our, our uh, legal advisor, inf informal, basically... We, we, we talked about, like, what, it, what are the laws? Just asking her, like, what are the laws around arrest? Can we get arrest? Can we be charged with resisting arrest? As she said, no, if we don't, co if we don't cooperate. So we decided, we're, we're, then I'm on Mauna Kea at, uh, you know, 9,000, 10,000 feet. Then if I'm getting arrested, I ain't walking to the paddy wagon. They're going to have to carry me. And I'm 200, uh, 230 pounds, and carrying me at 9,000 feet, for a police officer is difficult because they have to huff and puff, right? The air is thin, <sighs> you know? And they carried me, they carried Kalekoa, they carried Kahoakahi. And so these are tactics as well, right? You know, and at the end of the day, um, they kind of just gave up. <laughs> um, so there's, there's different things. It depends. It's situational. But as Camille said, the first thing really is who's arrestable? Because if we have to escalate, and we want to escalate who's going to be the ones to do it. And then the next step is how are we going to do it? I mean, simple thing is locking arms, what we call soft blockades. 
you get 30 people locking arms and they're not letting go or you know it, 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 it's a delay tactic it creates time um, delays and then of course there's chains there's there's um, cables there's lock boxes and many other ways to really to non to be non-cooperative anyone remember um, who the first group of people arrested on Mauna Kea was the group the hmm? Kupuna, yeah, Auntie Moani that we're honoring here today, um, Uncle Skippy, I guess he's Kupuna now, <laughs> don't tell him I said that, <laughs> um, yeah, Ron Fujiyoshi, but, but they, you know, they're not the ones out there that are gonna, you know, be muscle men, right, they're ones that are vulnerable, that are, um, that are really highlighting the message, and they, there was, what, 30 of them, was it, yeah, the first one? It was 30. And, you know, and in some cases, that takes long enough for it to stop operations that day. Um, but it's so powerful because the imagery that came out, Andy, uh, Auntie um, Le Leilani, or Leilani. Leilani, Auntie Leilani Lindsay, you know, the picture of her kneeling with her hands behind her back, just, you know, sobbing. It's so powerful because it just goes to show these aren't, these aren't folks coming out to be violent. They're not coming out um, angry. They're coming out for the Mauna, for the issue, and you know, just devastated by this building that they want to build up there. Um, so that's one of the things that they, they talk about is ar arrestable, willing, and also um, that really sends that message. You know, A lot of these other water struggles right now um, sometimes folks are getting arrested in the dark. You know, you don't get to see images of that. Um, so it's hard. You have to figure out how many people are with you and what can you do and what can be impactful and really get your message across to, like you said, pull more people into your side. We have enough time for one more question. Aloha mai kako, ova o mihina makere no kumokupuni ako imayo. Mahalo again for your time. Um, earlier, you touched on media coverage and some of the issues with that, and I was wondering if you had any strategies um, you'd like to recommend in terms of how to get our message as Kanako Oivi out when often Western media doesn't give uh, any time airtime to indigenous problems or are biased in favor of delegitimizing these types of efforts. Mahalo. So we all, we all have to know that the mainstream media is not actively our enemy, but they can work against us in big ways. Um, and sometimes they can be our enemy. But I guess what I want to say is you can never trust the mainstream ma media to get your message out the way you want it. So part of that, as Camille was saying, sometimes you might have a five-second soundbite. So getting your message really clear, and I've been in this situation where they ask me, so what about this? And I'll just say, you know, um, I'm trying to think of an example. That land is stolen Hawaiian lands. Yeah, but what about this? I just keep saying the same thing. That land, they don't have jurisdiction, it's stolen land. So one, being really clear and concise with your media, with, with your message, I'm sorry, and not letting them corral you into saying what they want you to say. I'll just keep repeating myself. But the other more important part is creating your own media. So now we have the digital platform of the internet that we can use, Facebook, um, YouTube. Um, in Standing Rock, there were tons of indigenous media. There's indigenous uh, media rising. Um, organ uh, groups of people. There was women's, uh, West Coast women warriors who were putting out media. There was uh, digital smoke signals who was putting out their own media. There was Unicorn Riot who was putting out amazing media. Um, so part of it is, Again, not relying on them, but taking control of the narrative for ourselves and exercising self-determination and learning how to do it ourselves. How do we exploit the, the, the internet, the media, Facebook, Instagram, um, and make it work for us? You know, and one of my dreams is that one of my children goes into digital media because I'll just recruit them back into the movement. Um, so yeah, so it's really about 
there's this concept that we used to teach in a curriculum, and I don't see Noy here, but Noy, um, Noy Goodyear um, wrote this into the curriculum, making power versus taking power. So taking power is when we want to try and control. Okay, Uncle, aloha, hui ho. Uh, when we want to try and take power that pre-exists, whether it's media, whether it's government, or the, the idea that we can make our own power. We can create our own media, you know. Um, and so that's something to think about, um, not relying on them at all, creating our own media opportunities. And I think, sorry, <laughs> it's also about... Um, understanding the media and, and being up on it, you know, having people dedicated to working on that part of the issue, that's critical, you know, recognizing that that role is one of your most important roles in your movement. And so, you know, the other side does it, the other side has PR people figuring these things out and understanding timing, understanding how you're gonna get it out, what's the vehicle gonna be, are you gonna put out a press release, are you gonna call a press conference, um, it's being, having folks that are studying that and recruiting them, you know, and saying, hey, help me. Because <laughs> not all of us, many of us are not good at that. Um, but that's, that's why understanding that everyone's role is so important because we need to have different roles. We can't have everyone be on the front line because no one's doing the back work, you know, to put out the messaging, to reach the media, to contact them, let them know. Um, but, you know, so, it, we need to value each other and all these avenues that we're going down to, to further our education, whether it's in the university or you know in the cobble patch, all of those places, we need to value each other and not try and fight each other and tell each other, oh, that's not important, but this is. You know, we don't know, that's the truth. We don't know what's gonna be important, but when the call comes, you wanna know who's where and how can, they, how can you work with them to get, accomplish your goal. And one thing is, I, I would, I would, my message to you is, learn how to do media, because we need you, the movement needs you. Um, you look at an organization. If you guys got Facebook, check out this org. I know, I met this um, activist. He's a badass. His name is John Sellers. He started an organization called The Other Ninety Eight Percent. They're on Facebook. They use Facebook. You know how many followers they have? I just looked at my phone right now six million followers and they really um learned and really are pioneers in the crafting of the meme the power of a simple meme now we see memes all over facebook and uh instagram and other social media platforms but one meme can really convey a lot right and so the other 98 percent are doing really awesome work using a free digital platform called facebook um so Think about these, I mean, things, and, and, and think about learning the media and, and doing it yourself. Because um, I, the work that we do and lots of the movement could really use that. Yep, mahalo. Right on. How about another hand for Andre Perez and Camille Kalama and our friends from Huli? So this concludes our Kuka Kuka tent, La Hoi Hoi 2018. I want to mahalo all of you guys for joining us. Um, this is the second year that Kua Kua Consulting has helped to organize. Um, this, this is the opportunity for mahalo. So I want to mahalo Brother Oren behind the camera, getting all of our sound system down. Media, media. media yep, media. Um, good dog right here. You guys can find both of them on their Facebook pages. Um, as well as Kingdom Media, Kingdom Media, right? King uh, uh, Kuana Productions, Kuana Productions Uncle, oh, that's right, Uncle Scotty. Um, what is Trevor? Brother uh, Trevor Atkins, who helped us with the sound system, as well as the, no, oh, the, the, I did. Uh, Doug, um, tr Brother Trevor Atkins with the sound and the sound system. Yep. We want to mahalo our friends with the Democratic Socialists of Honolulu, who has helped us with the volunteers around here. Mahalo those friends. I want to mahalo all of our panel speakers. And I just want to have a special mahalo to my ohana, my, my sister Jocelyn and my wife uh, Helena, taking care of the keikis while we doing our thing. So I want to encourage everybody to head back onto the main stage. Um, let's enjoy the last part of our La Hoi Hoi with Uncle Liko.
And um, if you guys want to support us, you guys can find us on Facebook, Cool Core Consulting. You guys can see us. If you guys want some fresh paiai poi, right over there on uh, Thursdays and Saturdays, we're on a Saturday road in Haula. So come check us out. Aloha aina. Ahui ho. Malama. <laughs>